Hey everyone, uh, my name's Aparna. I'm the co-founder of Mechanism Labs. Mechanism Labs is a blockchain research lab. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about one of the papers that we wrote, which is the meta-analysis of alternative consensus protocols. Um, so the reason we wrote this paper in the first place is that there are several different like consensus protocols coming out this year. Um, like 2018 has been the year of consensus in a weird way. Um, and if you have to go about like figuring out what different protocol, like how each protocol works, how they compare to one another, um, this paper will probably help you. So let's start off with a big picture. Why do you need other consensus protocols in the first place? Ethereum and Bitcoin are all using proof of work. Proof of work works, right? Well, it does, and it's great. Um, except it's not super energy efficient. Um, so a lot of people criticize proof of work for being wasteful of energy. Um, a defense to this that I hear oftentimes is that, uh, well, our current financial system uses like similar amounts of energy, so why does it matter? Well, if we're trying to build the future, we should try and build a more efficient and more green future. Um, at least that's my point of view. Um, the, if you come to think about it, the amount of energy that Bitcoin mining alone takes is probably comparable to what a whole country of like Iceland uses. And that's crazy to me. And that is just with today's level of transactions. If you had to bring in this whole world um, and have this sort of global currency, imagine how much of energy you'd be consuming. That's an insane amount of energy. The other issue with proof of work is that it provides the, the sense of security, and that's correct, that's absolutely true, um, and that security that it provides is basically a civil control mechanism which basically prevents people from creating multiple identities of themselves. The way proof of work does this is by essentially buying time from people. Um, but by buying time, it also means you're slowing down the process of consensus. Um, so we definitely need a more scalable civil control mechanism. Um, and the other biggest issue that I see is the current family of proof of work protocols don't really provide any sort of finality. Um, so how many of you here have been told that the blockchain is immutable? Well, do you believe that? Because China could be mining the largest, the longest blockchain and then they can release it tomorrow and all of Bitcoin's history can be um, rewritten. And that's the issue with any of the current family of proof of work blockchains. I'm not saying proof of work blockchains can't provide finality, it's just none of the current ones do. Um, so enter an alternative that's been talked about a lot this year, proof of stake. Um, and the idea with proof of stake is people act as stakeholders in the system um, and it's in their best interest to act honestly, if not, they're gonna lose their own coins and they're gonna lose value from the system. Um, so you get people who own this sort of value in the system to take care of the system. Um, so our paper basically looked at the following different protocols. Uh, there are definitely a lot more than these that exist, um, but when we wrote our paper, um, one, a lot of them it didn't have like white papers that we could academically do a fair um, job analyzing, so we chose these. So, so far I've talked a little bit about proof of work and proof of stake, but why is this meta-analysis important to you? Um, well, if you go on Twitter or if you go on any uh, social media or to conferences or any of these different events, you, you see different people advertising their blockchain as the best to you. Um, how do you go about discerning which one is good and which one's bad? Um, what's really fascinating to me is like, even with a lot of academic papers, there's this sort of like academic marketing language which starts to come in. Um, 
And if you are a developer and you're trying to build the next biggest dApp out there, you need the right platform for you. I don't think there is an objectively best protocol that exists because there are several impossibility results and trade-offs that make a lot of things, um, a lot of promises just like not, re not practically possible. Um, but there are definitely protocols that are unique to very, very specific use cases. Um, and the framework is essentially a way for you to go about understanding not just existing protocols, but also reading about future protocols and like learning about it for yourself. And even though we haven't analyzed all the future protocols, this is a tool for you to go out there and do that for yourself. Um, and lastly, if you're a researcher or if you're someone building another protocol, it's definitely nice to know what's already out there before you build another thing. Um, because oftentimes, it, a lot of people have had the same thought processes and like pivoted away for certain reasons. Um, and this is a valuable source of information. Um, so I've been talking so much about the framework. Let's get to it. Um, so when you start looking at any protocol, it's very important to understand the kind of assumptions surrounding it, which is essentially the model. Um, the model has three parts. The first is the network model. Um, so before I start jumping into all of this, something to consider is if you're thinking about use cases or if you're trying to think about what protocol to use, it's kind of nice to think about what degree of permissioned or permissionless a protocol, uh, a use case you want. Um, and that essentially will then tie into um, what model or like what protocol you choose. So the network model is basically how long does it take for a message um, to get from one person to another? Are there any assumptions on like, is there an upper bound in terms of time? Um, do you know for certain that within this period of time the message is going to get to someone? In which case, it's a synchronous model. If there is no upper bound on time, then that's an asynchronous model. And anything in the middle is either partially synchronous, semi-synchronous, all the other terms that you see. Um, the second most important thing to think about is the adversarial model, which is essentially, if I'm an adversary and I'm trying to attack different people in the network, how long does it take me to go from thinking about this attack that I want to execute to actually executing that attack. Um, and that essentially enables um, either an adaptive adversary or a static adversary. So a static adversary can obviously not, once a protocol has started executing, the adversary cannot attack any person in the protocol. Um, and the more you go into like strongly adaptive adversary, um, they can definitely attack the protocol instantaneously. Um, so why do either of these matter? Well, if you are building some sort of permissioned blockchain, or if you're trying to build, um, like, if you're trying to build a permission consortium use case, maybe you don't necessarily need um, an asynchronous network model. What you need is probably asynchronous is fine, probably even um, partially synchronous, because you're not using, maybe you're not really using the internet, um, and you don't have nodes all around the world, and you have them all in like the same place, um, or maybe they're all connected with fiber optic cables. Um, in terms of the adversarial model, um, if you're building a use case on top of a blockchain within a permissioned setting, um, you don't necessarily need to tolerate like the strongest kind of adversaries. Maybe all that you really need is something that tolerates a static adversary, um, especially if not everyone in the world can read or write to your blockchain. On the flip side, if you're building a cryptocurrency that's supposed to be like the global cryptocurrency, um, then you would definitely need something that's as close to asynchrony and something that tolerates the strongest kind of adversary possible. Um, so this then ties into the third important thing, which is an economic model. So a lot of people often talk about how an economic model is absolutely necessary for any blockchain. 
Um, and I think there's one caveat here, that if you have some sort of a permission blockchain, I don't think you need an extrinsic economic model. There's already intrinsic reason for people to run validators or run nodes because they want that data and they want to verify that data for themselves. If it's a consortium of banks um, trying to build a blockchain, they have intrinsic reason to run um, nodes and they don't necessarily need any sort of like uh, economic payout to do that. On the other hand, if you're trying to create a public blockchain, you definitely need some sort of economic incentives. So once you get past the assumptions, then you go into understanding how the protocol works. So the first step is thinking about who even is capable of making blocks or adding these blocks to the blockchain, and who is capable of verifying these blocks. And that's kind of the concept of proposer and committee election. Um, different people play the role of like adding blocks in different blockchains. Oftentimes, if everyone adds a block to the blockchain, it you have like too many messages in the network. So different consensus protocols try to like narrow down the number of people who are capable of adding a block in any round. And oftentimes, you even want to like narrow down the number of people who verify that the block is valid. Because if everyone in the world had to do that, that would be a very, very long process. Um, the second step is how do these blocks reach everyone else? Does everyone talk to everyone? Um, does one person talk to another person who then propagates it to the third? Um, how do these go about? Uh, how does this information reach everyone? Um, and the third step is finality. Once everyone's talked about it and once everyone knows all this information, what is the process of going from I know this to we are all in agreement about this specific blockchain and this specific blockchain is not going to change? Um, and that's where the idea of finality comes in. And finally, the idea of handling churn is uh, it ties back to like letting people join and leave the process of um, committee election or proposer election. So if people no longer want to be um, network keepers or caretakers, they should have the ability to leave. Um, and that's where handling churn comes in. Oh, went too fast. Okay, so the next thing to kind of like think about is if everyone was talking to everyone, there's a lot of messages happening um, and that's a lot of complexity. So one way that people get around this is by using some sort of randomness model. Um, so with proof of work, you sort of have this inbuilt randomness model in addition to a civil control mechanism, but proof of stake just provides you a civil control mechanism. It doesn't provide you this sort of innate randomness model. Um, so different protocols come out with different schemes to provide them randomness. Um, and when you're kind of thinking about randomness, you don't necessarily want randomness to be the reason that your protocol crashes. Um, so the security of the randomness model is important because it ties back to the strength of an adversary that your protocol can handle. Um, so the three kind of important things that you'd want your randomness scheme uh, to be safe against is you don't want it to be predictable, um, you don't want it to be biasable, and you don't want the randomness source to be revealed ahead of time. Um, the first two are kind of intuitive. The third is, is more subtle because um, if, for example, someone knows who the proposers or who the committee is ahead of time, um, it's possible that attackers can then go ahead and DOS them and they can't add their blocks to the blockchain. And that way you kind of prevent the chain from growing in a particular round. Um, so how does this tie back to the adversarial model? Well, if you know ahead of time who the people are, the amount of time that you know um, who the proposer or who's in the committee, um, that gives you this sort of like leg up in terms of you being able to attack them. If the amount of time is small, obviously you can't attack someone um, very quickly, but 
if the amount of time is large, then you definitely have this capability of going ahead and dosing people. Um, if you want to read more about randomness, um, we recently wrote a blog on that, so you can check that out for more information. Um, so the other important things that you want to kind of think about with any protocol is, is finality guaranteed? So with Bitcoin, for example, finality is not guaranteed because China can come and rewrite the blockchain. Um, Yes, there is the possibility of like the social layer stepping in, but if it's possible to build a protocol that gives you finality in the first place, um, I think that's sometimes a nice property to have depending on the use case. Um, and the other thing is, does a protocol like handle churn? Does it handle people joining and leaving? Um, and all of these kind of tie back to the extent of permission or permissionless that a system can be. So if, for example, um, your protocol can't handle churn, um, then that essentially means people are forced to be online all the time. Um, and that kind of like narrows down the number of people who can potentially be validators in the first place because that requires a huge amount of capital or investment on their side to build something that's so technically capable of being online all the time. Um, and the last property is kind of like, what does your protocol do in case of a network partition? So there's a very famous theorem that says, in the case of a network partition, either your protocol can be available and like online, but there might be some misinformation, or your protocol can be consistent, so it'll stop working and you'll no longer have a growing blockchain, but all the data will be, uh, everyone in the world will have one common view. And now I think it's very subtle, but there are different use cases which require both of these properties or like um, one or the other. And obviously based on, so for example, if you're building a payment system, maybe what you really want is a consistent blockchain. Like in the case that um, the internet goes out, you don't necessarily want like fake transactions kind of happening and then like getting reverted. Um, on the flip side, if you're building some sort of gaming or live streaming application, maybe you want a more available blockchain. Um, and all of these kind of tie in to is finality guaranteed. Um, if you want to learn more about finality, you can read our other blog, uh, our other blog post, which we wrote there. Um, so that's pretty much it for this presentation. If you have any questions, go for it. Uh, can I extend? Uh, wait a second. We have time for one question, and then we go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you were kind of describing the ability to predict somebody you could do denial of service. I would propose an, another proposed, <clears throat> another possible attack. You could collude. Mm -hmm. Then uh, is denial, uh, collusion is much more efficient than denial of service. Yeah. Yeah. That was a statement or a question? Uh, I, I think a statement. Perfect. With that statement in mind, uh, there are so many questions you can ask during lunch, uh, but I don't want to be in the middle of you and a hungry stomach. <laughs>